Even decades later, the surveillance image above remains etched in the minds of the millions who are familiar with the James Bolger case. To those who aren't familiar, the scene looks harmless enough. Two boys leading a toddler, one holding his hand as they make their way through a normal shopping mall in Boodle, England on February 12, 1993. The older boys, John Venables and Robert Thompson, seem like they could be the brothers of the toddler. James Bulger, as some bystanders thought in the mall that day. But they weren't. Instead, they were the toddler's abductors and, soon, his killers. Within hours of that surveillance image being captured that afternoon, 10-year-olds John Venables and Robert Thompson had tortured 2-year-old James Bulger to death. And in the time between when that image was captured and when James Bulger was killed in a railway embankment, a few miles away, the three boys had been seen walking around the Merseyside area by dozens of people. Many of these witnesses later admitted that Bulger looked distressed. Some even saw the older boys punch and kick the two-year-old. But most did nothing, and those that stopped and questioned the James Bulger killer soon enough let them go on their way to ultimately murder the toddler. First, of course, John Venables and Robert Thompson had to snatch Bulger away from his mother in the midst of a busy shopping mall. The boys ended up at the New Strand Shopping Center in Boodle, near Liverpool, on the afternoon of February 12th after having skipped school that day. At the mall, James killers wandered from shop to shop, stealing anything they could get their hands on then tossing their stolen booty down escalators, just for the fun of it. At some point, for reasons that still remain unclear more than two decades later, Venables and Thompson decided to steal someone's child. After they were arrested, each blamed the other. James was not the first child that the pair tried to abduct. In fact, that first child nearly became the victim. Inside a TJ Hughes department store, a woman noticed that two boys were trying to get her kid's attention. Moments later, her three-year-old daughter and two-year-old son were missing. The mother quickly found her daughter, but there was no sign of her son. Frantically, she asked her daughter where he was. Gone outside with the boy, she said. The woman began calling for her son and ran outside, where she found Venables and Thompson beckoning the boy to follow them. When Venables saw the mother, they told the boy to go back to her, and they vanished. Mere luck had saved the boy and sealed James Bulger's terrible fate. Soon after the aborted abduction, Venables and Thompson were loitering around a snack kiosk, hoping to steal candy when they noticed James Bulger by the door of a nearby butcher's shop. With Bulger's mother, Denise, momentarily distracted, they got the toddler to come with them. Venables took him by the hand. Several shoppers later remembered noticing the trio as they walked through the mall. Sometimes Bulger ran ahead, leaving Venables and Thompson to beckon him back with calls of come on, baby. They were caught by a surveillance camera leaving the mall at 3.42 p.m. By this time, Denise was panicking. She had thought that her son was by her side as she was placing her order at the butcher shop. But when she looked down, he was gone. She quickly found mall security personnel and described her son and what he was wearing. At first, they announced the boy's name over the mall's loudspeakers. By 4, 15 p.m., however, there was no sign of James Bulger and he was reported missing to the local police station. Meanwhile, after Venables, Thompson, and Bulger had left the mall, the toddler began crying out for his mother. The older boys ignored him and continued down to a secluded area near a canal. At the canal, they dropped Bulger on his head and left him on the ground, crying. A woman passing by noticed Bulger but did nothing. Venables and Thompson then called for Bulger to come. And still, he followed. By now, however, his forehead was bruised and cut, causing Venables and Thompson to pull the hood of the toddler's anorak over his head to try and hide the injury. Nevertheless, additional passers-by could still see the partially covered forehead injury, and one person even saw a tear on Bulger's cheek, but no one did anything. The older boys then meandered around Liverpool past shops, 
buildings, and parking lots. They walked down one of Liverpool's busiest streets. Some witnesses later remembered seeing Bulger laughing, while others remembered seeing him resisting and even screaming for his mother. One person even saw Thompson kick Bulger in the ribs for resisting. Still, no one did anything. Soon after, a woman saw Thompson punch Bulger and shake him. But she pulled her curtains and blocked out the scene. But one bystander provided a glimmer of hope, however fleeting. For James Bulger, with evening approaching, an elderly woman saw Bulger crying, noticed his injuries, and approached the trio to inquire what was wrong. But the two ten-year-olds said, we just found him at the bottom of the hill. Apparently satisfied with their explanation, the woman simply told the two boys to take the toddler down to the nearby Walton Lane police station. She called out to them once more as they walked away, but they did not look back. She was concerned, but another woman standing nearby said she'd heard James laughing moments ago. And so both assumed nothing was wrong. Later that night, one of the women saw the news that Bulger was missing. She phoned the police and expressed regret for not doing something. Not long after the elderly woman sent the boys on their way, Bulger was almost rescued yet again. A woman concerned for the toddler told Venables and Thompson that she would take the child to the police station herself. But when she asked another woman nearby to look after her daughter while she did so, that woman refused because her dog did not like children. And so Bulger slipped away from safety once again. Venables, Thompson, and Bulger then walked into two different stores, where they interacted with both shopkeepers who, though suspicious of the older boys, let them go. Then Venables and Thompson came upon two older boys that they knew. These boys asked who the toddler was, and Venables replied that he was Thompson's brother, and that they were taking him home. Then they arrived at the railway. The boys hesitated, perhaps reconsidering what they were about to do, and did briefly turn away from the embankment. But then John Venables and Robert Thompson turned back toward the privacy of the deserted railway. The brutal torture and murder of James Bulger occurred sometime between 5.45 and 6.30 p.m. Venables and Thompson had brought blue paint stolen from the shopping mall and splashed it in Bulger's left eye. They then kicked him, pummeled him with bricks and stones, and stuffed batteries into his mouth. Finally, the boys hit Bulger over the head with a 22-pound iron bar, which resulted in 10 skull fractures. All in all, Bulger sustained 42 injuries to his face, head, and body. He was so badly battered, authorities later concluded, that there was no way to tell which injury represented the fatal blow. Eventually, Venables and Thompson placed Bulger's dead body. A forensic pathologist later concluded that he was dead at this point, across the train tracks, in hopes of making the whole thing look like an accident, and abandoned the scene before a train came along and severed the toddler in two. The next day, police searched the canal where the boys had been earlier in the afternoon because an eyewitness had reported seeing Bulger there. Other searches were conducted elsewhere, all leading to nothing. With little to go on, Bulger's parents were suspects initially. But when the police eventually saw the CCTV footage from the shopping mall, they could not believe their eyes. Despite the fuzzy footage, it was two small boys that could be seen leading James Bulger, identified from the description of his clothing provided by his mother, to the exit. Once those CCTV images were released to the media, the story went nationwide, and the search for Bulger intensified. When Bulger's father, Ralph, saw that it was just two boys with whom his son had left the mall, he was relieved. I looked at Denise and smiled with relief. He's gonna be all right, Denise, I said. He's with two young kids. He's gonna be all right. The search ended two days after the disappearance, when four children discovered Bulger's body on the railway track, just 200 yards from the nearest police station. All of the instruments used in the attack were found strewn around the area. The iron bar, stones, and bricks all covered in the boy's blood. The stolen tin of blue paint was found nearby. 
With some evidence in hand and the knowledge that the James Bulger killers were likely two children, the police checked nearby schools' absentee lists for the day of the disappearance. This caused various children to be identified as potential killers, with some parents even reporting their own kids. But it was ultimately an anonymous phone call to the police that implicated John Venables and Robert Thompson as the James Bulger killers. The caller told the police that Venables and Thompson were both absent from school on Friday and that they themselves had seen blue paint on the sleeve of Venables' jacket. The police then visited both children's homes and discovered blood on Thompson's shoes and blue paint on Venables' jacket. Despite this evidence, however, Venables and Thompson weren't initially the authorities' prime suspects. Police were focused on other children who already had violent records, and they remained convinced that the two boys from the fuzzy CCTV footage looked 13 or 14, not 10. But during separate police interviews, John Venables and Robert Thompson turned on each other. Over the course of interviews lasting several days, Venables eventually confessed. I did kill him, Venables said. What about his mom? Will you tell her I'm sorry? Robert Thompson, on the other hand, was not such an easy interview. He totally denied everything said Detective Sergeant Phil Roberts. But in the end, he shot himself in the foot by giving me a detailed account of what James Bulger was wearing. Nevertheless, throughout the whole process, Thompson remained chillingly unfazed, earning him the nickname the boy who did not cry from the press. Venables and Thompson were both charged. Nine months later, the trial began. Outside the courthouse, people called for the blood of the James Bulger killers. Kill the bastards, people yelled. A life for a life. Popular disgust only intensified when witnesses and the media noted Thompson's cold, seemingly remorseless behavior at trial, compared with Venable's hysterical outbursts. Thus, it was widely assumed that Thompson was the instigator even though psychiatrists and authorities have never been able to reach a conclusion on the boy's motives. But Blake Morrison, the author of As If, A Crime, A Trial, A Question of Childhood, a book on the trial, points out that Venables had a temper and had been known to lose control and had had him some pretty weird things, and it was just as likely that he was the instigator. Moreover, Court-appointed psychiatrists determined that the two boys knew right from wrong and weren't sociopaths, but were nevertheless able to uncover any concrete motives for James Bulger's murder, something no professional has been able to confidently determine even in the years since. Motive aside, both John Venables and Robert Thompson were convicted, making them the youngest to be convicted of that crime in Britain in 250 years. As the jury foreman read the verdict, Venables and Thompson were sitting in an adult court dock that had been altered so that the boys could see over it. Venables and Thompson were then sentenced to serve at Her Majesty's pleasure. As is standard protocol for juvenile offenders convicted of murder or manslaughter, this indefinite sentence has no maximum but does have a minimum to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. In this case, it was just eight years, at which time the boys would be 18. After that point, the James Bulger killers were to be assessed and, if they weren't deemed to be a danger to society, released. By all accounts, Venables and Thompson showed no violent or aberrant behavior in prison, but instead served their time for the James Bulger murder quietly and without incident. So, when the eight years were up in 2001, both boys were released. Upon their release, John Venables and Robert Thompson were given new identities and granted legal anonymity for life due to the public fury that surrounded their trial and the danger of citizens hunting down the infamous James Bulger killers in order to take vengeance. To date, no significant attempts at vengeance have been made. James Bulger's mother, Denise, was able to locate Robert Thompson in 2004, but was paralyzed with hatred and could not confront him. Today, while Thompson is believed to be assimilating back into society and living a quiet life, 
the same cannot be said of Venables. In 2010, he was imprisoned for downloading images depicting various kinds of sexual abuse being inflicted upon male toddlers. He became eligible for parole in 2013, at which time Ralph Bolger told the parole board that he couldn't forgive his son's killers and that Venables should not be released. Sometimes you feel like you're having a heart attack, he said at the time. It's just a big knot in your chest, and that's been there since day one. Nevertheless, Venables was released. But in November 2017, John Venables was again imprisoned when more child abuse images and a pedophile manual that provided instructions on having sex with kids were discovered on his computer. Joan was sentenced to three years and four months in prison, not far from half the amount of time he served for joining Robert Thompson in perpetrating the murder of James Bulger a quarter century before. Venables made headlines again in September 2023 when he was granted a parole hearing to take place in November. James Bulger's immediately spoke out, saying once more that Venables should spend the rest of his life in prison for the shocking crime he committed that tragic day in 1993. Mary Vincent was a 15-year-old runaway heading to visit her grandfather in California when she accepted a ride from a man named Lawrence Singleton in September 1978, and it changed her life forever. Singleton seemed friendly enough at first, but the Fay aide didn't last long. Soon after picking up young Vincent, Singleton assaulted her, raped her multiple times, and then cut her arms off before dumping her into the Del Puerto Canyon. That should have been the end for Vincent, but the teenager managed to stumble three miles to the nearest road, where she was discovered and taken to the hospital. She had survived a harrowing ordeal, but her story was only beginning. Mary Vincent grew up in Las Vegas, but she ran away from home at the age of 15. She moved to California with her boyfriend, where the two lived out of a car. However, he was soon arrested for raping another teenage girl and Vincent was on her own. On September 29, 1978, she decided to hitchhike nearly 400 miles to Corona, California, where her grandfather lived. When 50-year-old Lawrence Singleton pulled over and offered Vincent a ride, she naively accepted, as he seemed like a friendly older man. Not long after climbing into Singleton's van, Mary Vincent realized she may have made a mistake. He asked her if she was sick after she sneezed, and then put his hand on her neck to check her temperature. However, Vincent thought that he was simply being kind, and she soon fell asleep. When she awoke, however, she noticed they were traveling the wrong way on the road. She grew uneasy and found a sharp stick in the vehicle. Vincent pointed it at Singleton and ordered him to turn around. Singleton claimed he was just an honest man who made a mistake and started driving back in the right direction, but he soon pulled over to take a bathroom break. Vincent stepped out of the vehicle to stretch her legs and bent over to tie her shoe, and then Singleton hit her in the head and dragged her into the back of the van. He raped her while telling her that he would kill her if she screamed. As Vincent begged Singleton to let her go, he suddenly said, You want to be free? I'll set you free." He then grabbed a hatchet and cut off both of the girl's arms below the elbow and stated, "'Okay, now you're free.'" Singleton pushed Mary Vincent down an embankment and left her to die in a concrete pipe. But against all odds, she somehow managed to survive. Naked and falling in and out of consciousness, Mary Vincent managed to crawl out of the canyon and walk three miles back to Interstate 5. She held what remained of her arms straight up so that she wouldn't lose as much blood. The first car that Vincent saw turned around and sped away, frightened by the sight of her. Fortunately, a second car stopped and drove her to a nearby hospital. After intense surgery to save her life, she was fitted with prosthetic arms, a change that would take years of physical therapy for her to adjust to. She also underwent intensive psychotherapy to help her cope with the trauma she'd experienced. I'd have been lead dancer at the Lido de Paris in Las Vegas, 
Vincent said in 1997. Then Hawaii and Australia? I'm serious. I was really good on my feet. But when this happened, they had to take some parts out of my leg just to save my right arm. Thankfully, Vincent was able to provide such a detailed description of Lawrence Singleton to authorities that he was quickly identified by the police sketch and arrested. Mary Vincent testified against her attacker in court, and as she left the stand, Singleton reportedly whispered to her, I'll finish this job if it takes me the rest of my life. Ultimately, Singleton was found guilty of rape, kidnapping, and attempted murder. However, he served just over eight years in prison and was released on parole for good behavior. From that point on, Vincent lived her life in fear, worried that Singleton would follow through on his promise one day. Tragically, he did, but Vincent wasn't the one on the receiving end. By the late 1990s, Singleton had moved to Florida as he couldn't find a community in California willing to accept him. On February 19, 1997, he lured a sex worker named Roxanne Hayes into his home and violently murdered her. Neighbors heard Hayes' screams and called the police, but it was too late. Officers arrived to find her body on the floor, covered in blood and stab wounds. Mary Vincent flew from California to Florida when she learned of Singleton's arrest to testify on Roxanne Hayes' behalf. In court, she detailed her own story to highlight just how depraved a man Lawrence Singleton was and why he should be sentenced to death. I was raped, she told the jury. I had my arms cut off. He used a hatchet. He left me to die. Singleton was sentenced to death on April 14, 1998. He spent three years in prison awaiting his execution, but he died from cancer at the age of 74 while still on death row, Mary Vincent could live in peace for the first time in decades. In the years following the attack, Vincent wasn't sure she would ever live a normal life. She'd struggled, gotten married and then divorced, had two children and eventually founded the Mary Vincent Foundation to help other survivors of violent crimes. He destroyed everything about me, she once said of Singleton, my way of thinking my way of life, holding on to innocence and I'm still doing everything I can to hold on. In 2003, she told the Seattle Post Intelligencer, I've broken bones thanks to my nightmares. I've jumped up and dislocated my shoulder, just trying to get out of bed. I've cracked ribs and smashed my nose. Eventually, however, Vincent discovered art and it helped her cope with the trauma of what she'd been through. She couldn't afford to buy high-end prosthetic arms, so she created her own using parts from refrigerators and stereo systems. And she taught herself to draw and paint using her inventions. Before the attack, Mary Vincent stated, I couldn't draw a straight line. Even with a ruler, I would mess it up. This is something that woke up after the attack, and my artwork has inspired me and given me self-esteem. Toolbox killers Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris killed five teenage girls in just five months and recorded some of their horrific torture and murder sessions for their own amusement. The depraved duo became known as the Toolbox Killers. Using devices for torturing their victims more commonly found in the garage, Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris were a sadistically brutal pair of serial rapists and killers stalking teenage girls across the Los Angeles area for five dark months in 1979. From their van, they picked up hitchhikers, driving them to secluded spots where they could indulge in their most gruesome rape and torture fantasies. Their crimes, particularly the Halloween torture and murder of Shirley Ledford, would cause FBI profiler John Douglas to classify Bittaker as the most disturbing individual for whom he has ever created a criminal profile. Finally arrested after a sickening five-month murder spree, the prosecutor in their trial would similarly describe the events of that Halloween night as one of the most shocking, brutal cases in the history of American crime. Lawrence Sigmund Bittaker was born on September 27, 1940, 
and adopted as an infant. By his early teens, he was sent to the California Youth Authority for car theft. Released at 19, he never saw his adoptive parents again. Over the next 15 years, Bittaker was in and out of prison for assault, burglary, and grand theft. He was diagnosed by a prison psychiatrist as being highly manipulative and as having considerable concealed hostility. In 1974, Bittaker stabbed a supermarket employee, barely missing his heart, and was convicted of assault with a deadly weapon, then sentenced to California Men's Colony in San Luis Obispo. Roy Lewis Norris was born on February 5, 1948, and lived with his family occasionally, but was more often placed in the care of foster families. Norris allegedly suffered neglect by these families, and sexual abuse by at least one. Norris dropped out of high school, briefly joined the Navy, and was then honorably discharged with a diagnosis of severe schizoid personality by military psychologists. In May 1970, Norris was on bail for another offense when he violently attacked a female student with a rock on the campus of San Diego State University. Charged for the offense, Norris served almost five years at Atascadero State Hospital, classified as a mentally disordered sex offender. Norris was released on probation in 1975, declared of no further danger to others. Three months later, he raped a 27-year-old woman after dragging her into some bushes. In 1976, Norris was incarcerated in the same prison as Bittaker, bringing the future toolbox killers together. By 1978, Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris had become close prison acquaintances, sharing a perverse obsession with sexual violence against women. Norris told Bittaker his biggest thrill was overwhelming women with fear and terror. And Bittaker confided that if he ever raped a woman, he would kill her to avoid leaving behind a witness, fantasizing about sexually assaulting and murdering teenage girls. Both men pledged that they would reunite once released and planned to murder one girl of each teenage year, 13 through 19. Bittaker was released in November 1978, and Norris followed on January 1979. Within a month, Norris had raped a woman. Then, as promised, Norris received a letter from Bittaker, and the pair met and began to put their twisted prison plan into action. Abducting teenage girls discreetly wouldn't be easy. They needed a suitable vehicle. Bittaker proposed a van. Norris put up the cash. And in February 1979, Bittaker purchased a silver 1977 GMC Vandora. The passenger side sliding door would allow them to pull up to potential victims without having to slide the door all the way. They nicknamed their van the Murder Mac. The pair picked up over 20 hitchhikers from February to June 1979, but didn't assault these girls. Rather, these were practice runs. Scouting for secure locations, in late April 1979, they found an isolated fire road in the San Gabriel Mountains. Bittaker snapped the lock on the entry gate with a crowbar and replaced it with his own. According to the book Alone with the Devil by courtroom psychiatrist Ronald Markman, in final preparations, Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris created a toolbox for torture. They bought plastic tape, pliers, rope, knives, an ice pick, as well as a Polaroid camera and tape recorder. Then the toolbox killers were ready to indulge in their sadism. Between late June and September 1979, the pair abducted, raped, and killed four teenage girls, ranging in age from 13 to 17. They drove their victims to the Mountain Fire Road, where they inflicted pain from their toolbox assortment the girls' screams forever lost in the mountain canyons. After realizing manual strangulation wasn't as easy as the movies, Bittaker started using wire from a coat hanger tightened with pliers. The depravity increased for Andre Hall, their second victim. Up in the mountains, Bittaker inserted an ice pick through her ear, then tried the other side and finally stomped on the handle until it snapped. Hall, miraculously still alive, 
was finally strangled by Bittaker. And when the pair were finished with her, they threw her over the mountainside. The level of terror, pain, and sexual assault was escalating for Bittaker and Norris victims. The pair's evil would only be surpassed in later years by serial killers Leonard Lake and Charles. On September 2nd, two younger girls were snatched hitchhiking. 15-year-old Jacqueline Gilliam was continually raped by both men as Bittaker recorded her horror. Bittaker took photos of her in various states of naked distress, tormenting Gilliam by asking for reasons why he shouldn't kill her. Meanwhile, 13-year-old Lee Lamp was left untouched under sedation. After two days of terror, Bittaker thrust his ice pick through Gilliam's ear, then strangled her with his coat hanger and pliers. The toolbox killers then roused Lamp and bludgeoned her on the head with a sledgehammer as she stepped from the van. Bittaker choked her, and Norris struck her repeatedly with a hammer, with both girls' bodies finally thrown down a ravine. The repeated rape, unspeakable brutality, and horrific torture that Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris inflicted on 16-year-old Shirley Ledford was all recorded for their sick enjoyment. Late on Halloween night, 1979, Ledford left her restaurant shift toward a party in a colleague's car. From a gas station, Ledford decided to walk or hitchhike home rather than go to the party. And she may have entered the van after recognizing Bittaker as a customer from the restaurant. With Bittaker's tape recorder running, Ledford was immediately bound and gagged. For two hours, Ledford was subjected to agonizing trauma as the pair took turns alternately driving the van, raping and torturing her. Bittaker repeatedly beat her with a sledgehammer, twisted, squeezed, and tore at her breasts and vagina with pliers, as both men encouraged Ledford to scream louder for the tape. After Norris reigned, repeated hammer blows to her elbow, then strangled her with a coat hanger and pliers, Ledford can be heard begging for death. Do it, just kill me. When Bittaker and Norris had finished with her, Shirley Ledford's body was left in a grisly display on the front lawn of a nearby house. Roy Norris revealed the pair's rapes and murders to another rapist he had been incarcerated with, including Ledford's murder, the only toolbox victim yet to be found. Norris also confided that another woman had been raped by them, but released afterward. The man notified police via his attorney, and investigators matched reports of several teenage girls reported missing over the previous five months to Norris's claims. There was also the September 30 report of a young woman dragged into a GMC van and raped by two men in their mid-30s. The rape victim was shown mugshots and positively identified Bittaker and Norris. Norris was arrested for a parole violation on November 20th, 1979, with Bittaker arrested for rape at his motel the same day. The search of Norris's apartment revealed a bracelet of Ledford's while in Bittaker's motel room. Police found numerous photographs and other incriminating evidence. Investigators seized and searched Bittaker's silver van, where they seized several items, including several cassette tapes one of which contained Ledford's torture. Ledford's mother confirmed it was her daughter on the recording, screaming, pleading, and begging for her life. Investigators confirmed the voices on the tape belonged to Bittaker and Norris. Norris initially denied all accusations, then faced with the evidence, confessed to five murders. Norris, seeking a plea deal to testify against Bittaker, took investigators into the San Gabriel Mountains, where the skulls of Gilliam and Lamp were eventually found. Roy Norris plead guilty, sparing him the death penalty, and on May 7, 1980, was sentenced to 45 years to life. With parole eligibility from 2010, Lawrence Bittaker's trial began on January 19, 1981. Norris testified about their shared history and the five murders committed by them. Introducing photographic evidence, a witness from Bittaker's motel testified that he had been shown naked photos of distressed girls by Bittaker and told one of them had been killed. Another 17-year-old girl testified that Bittaker had played her a cassette tape 
apparently the rape of Gilliam, according to court records. Then, the 17-minute audio of Shirley Ledford was played for the jury, and many cried, burying their heads in their hands. Prosecutor Stephen Kay was reduced to tears, but Bittaker sat through the whole thing smiling. Norris had testified Bittaker that amused himself by playing the tape while driving in the weeks before arrest. On February 5th, Bittaker testified himself, denying rape and murder, stating he paid the girls for sex and permission to take their photographs. In closing, Prosecutor Kay told the jury, if the death penalty is not appropriate in this case, then when will it ever be? On February 17th, the jury found Bittaker guilty of five counts of first-degree murder and several other charges, and on February 19th, Bittaker was sentenced to death. On death row after various appeals and stays of execution, Bittaker never expressed any remorse for his crimes but did seem to revel in his celebrity. Autographing items with the name Pliers Bittaker. He died in San Quentin State Prison on December 13, 2019. Norris died in prison of natural causes on February 24, 2020. In the aftermath of the toolbox killer's savagery, Stephen Kay reported recurring nightmares. He would be rushing to Bittaker's van to prevent harm coming to the girls, but would always get there too late. Meanwhile, Shirley Ledford's tape is retained by the FBI and it's used to this day to train FBI agents about the reality of torture and murder. On April 16, 1996, James Patterson Smith contacted Greater Manchester Police to say that his teenage girlfriend, Kelly Ann Bates, had accidentally drowned in the tub. Though he claimed he tried to resuscitate her, she was dead at the age of just 17. However, when police arrived at Smith's house, the scene was far worse than anything they could have ever expected. Not only was Bates dead, but her blood was found all over the house, and she'd clearly suffered dozens of gruesome injuries before her drowning. The authorities quickly arrested James Patterson Smith and his story fell apart almost immediately. Soon, the post-mortem examination showed that Smith had brutally tortured Kellyanne Bates for weeks before she finally died. As the pathologist later said, in my career, I have examined almost 600 victims of homicide, but I have never come across injuries so extensive. This is the disturbing story of Kellyanne Bates' murder at the hands of James Patterson Smith. One day, Margaret Bates returned home to her house in Hattersley, England to find her 16-year-old daughter, Kelly Ann, standing in the kitchen. Unbeknownst to her mother, Kelly Ann had brought her boyfriend home for the first time. Next came the sound of footsteps on the stairs as the boyfriend, James Patterson Smith, walked into the room. Margaret was shocked to find that Smith was in his mid-40s. Obviously, no mother would be happy to learn that their daughter was dating someone so much older than she was. But for Margaret, it went further than that. There was something deeply disturbing about Smith. This wasn't the man I wanted for my daughter. I vividly recall seeing our bread knife in the kitchen and wanting to pick it up and stab him in the back. She said in a later interview, Margaret would later regret her decision not to stab Smith then and there because her daughter's relationship with James Patterson Smith would soon end with him torturing and killing her so brutally that the court provided the jurors at his trial with counseling afterward. The couple had met in 1993, when Kellyanne Bates was just 14, and they'd been keeping the relationship largely secret from her mother until that fateful moment in the kitchen. In November 1995, not long after the meeting in the kitchen, Kelly Ann moved in with the unemployed Smith in nearby Gorton. Though skeptical of the decision, her parents agreed on the condition that she keep in regular contact. But over the next few months, their once outgoing daughter grew withdrawn. And when she stopped by for a rare visit, her parents noticed bruises on her arms. James Patterson Smith had a long history of abusing the women he lived with, 
His first marriage ended in accusations of physical violence, and other women Smith had dated told similar stories. He even once tried to drown a 15-year-old girlfriend. Smith was no different with Kellyanne Bates and regularly beat her, but after a few months, the abuse escalated to a terrifying new level. The true extent of the abuse only became clear on April 16, 1996, when Smith walked into the Gorton police station and said that he'd accidentally killed Kellyanne Bates after their argument while she was in the bath caused her to drown. How exactly he framed this as an accident to police remains unclear. But when the authorities soon found Kellyanne's body inside Smith's house, her injuries told a far darker story. The pathologist who examined the body found more than 150 injuries inflicted over a period of at least a month. In the weeks leading up to her death, Smith was starving Bates, and even kept her tied to a radiator by her hair. She had been burned with a hot iron, strangled, and stabbed dozens of times in the legs, torso, and mouth. Smith had also disfigured her by cutting at her scalp, face, and genitals with assorted tools, including pruning shears. He'd even gouged out her eyes at least five days before he finally killed her by drowning her in the tub. The case went to trial, during which the prosecutors laid out the torture Bates had endured for the jury. The physical pain would have been intense, one prosecutor said, causing anguish and torment to the point of mental breakdown and collapse. At the trial, other women that Smith had abused came forward to paint a picture of a misogynistic man who was obsessively jealous and turned to violence to control others. Meanwhile, Smith argued that he was the real victim. He claimed that Bates drove him to kill her by taunting him. She put me through hell, winding me up, he said. He even argued that she inflicted some of her injuries herself to make him look bad. But the jury didn't buy it and quickly found 49-year-old James Patterson Smith guilty of murdering Kellyanne Bates. On November 19, 1997, he was sentenced to a minimum of 20 years in prison. Some accounts say 25, where he remains to this day. As for Margaret Bates, she still thinks back to that moment in the kitchen when she first met Smith. It was a bizarre thought. She said of her desire to kill him right there. I would never normally think of anything so violent. And now I wonder whether it was some sort of sixth sense. Junko Furuta was just 17 years old when she was raped, beaten, and killed by four teenage boys in 1980s Japan. As far as Shinji Minato's parents were concerned, Junko Furuta was their son's girlfriend the pretty young girl hung around with their son so often that it seemed as if she were living at their home. Even when they began to suspect that her perpetual presence wasn't always consensual, they labored under the delusion that everything was fine. After all, they feared their son's violent tendencies and his friend's connections to the Yakuza, a powerful organized crime syndicate in Japan. But as far as Shinji Minato and his friends, Hiroshi Miyano, Joe Ogura, and Yasushi Watanabe were concerned. Junko Furuta was their captive, their sex slave, and their punching bag for 44 days straight. And tragically, on her last day of horrific torture, she would become their murder victim. Junko Furuta was born in Misato, Saitama, Japan, in 1971. And up until her kidnapping at age 17, she was a normal girl. Furuta was known for being pretty, bright, and getting good grades at Yashio Minami High School. Despite her good girl reputation, she didn't drink, smoke, or use drugs. She was quite popular at school and seemingly had a bright future ahead of her. But everything changed in November 1988. At the time, her future kidnapper, Hiroshi Miyano, was known as the school bully, often bragging about his connections to the Yakuza. According to some of their classmates, Miyano had developed somewhat of a crush on Furuta and was enraged when she turned him down. After all, 
No one had ever dared to reject him, especially after he told them of his Yakuza friends. A few days after the rejection, Miyano and Minato were hanging around a local park in Misato, preying on innocent women. As experienced gang rapists, Miyano and Minato were experts at spotting potential targets. Around 8.30 p.m., the boys noticed Junko Furuta on her bicycle. At the time, she was on her way home from her job. Minato kicked Furuta off of her bike, creating a diversion, at which point Miyano stepped in, pretending to be an innocent and concerned bystander. After helping her up, he asked her if she wanted an escort home, which Furuta unwittingly accepted. She never saw her loved ones again. Miyano led Furuta to an abandoned warehouse, where he told her of his Yakuza connections and raped her, threatening to kill her and her family if she made a sound. He then took her to a park where Minato, Ogura, and Watanabe were waiting. There, the other boys also raped her. Then, they smuggled her into a home that was owned by Minato's family. Though Furuta's parents called the police and reported their daughter missing, the boys made sure they wouldn't go looking for her, forcing her to call home and say that she had run away and was staying with a friend. Whenever Minato's parents were around, Furuta was forced to pose as his girlfriend, though they eventually realized that something wasn't right. Unfortunately, the threat of the Yakuza coming after them was enough to keep them quiet, and for 44 days, Minato's parents lived in alarming ignorance of the real-life horror story that was unfolding in their own home. Over the course of those 44 days, Junko Furuta was raped over 400 times by Miyano and his friends, as well as other boys and men that the four captors knew. While torturing her, they would insert iron bars, scissors, skewers, fireworks, and even a lit light bulb into her vagina and anus, destroying her internal anatomy, which left her unable to defecate or urinate properly. When they weren't raping her, the boys forced her to do other terrible things, like eating live cockroaches, masturbating in front of them, and drinking her own urine. Her body, still very much alive at that point, was hung from the ceiling and beaten with golf clubs bamboo sticks, and iron rods. Her eyelids and genitals were burned with cigarettes, lighters, and hot wax. And the torture didn't stop until Furuta was dead. One of the most tragic things about Junko Furuta's agonizing torture and eventual murder is that it all could have been prevented. Twice, the police were alerted to Furuta's condition, and they failed to intervene both times. The first time, a boy who had been invited over to the Minato house by Miyano went home after seeing Furuta and told his brother about what was happening. The brother then decided to tell his parents, who contacted the police. The authorities showed up at the Minato residence, but were assured by the family that there was no girl inside. The answer was clearly satisfactory enough for the police, as they never returned to the home. The second time, it was Furuta herself who called the cops. But before she was able to say anything, the boys discovered her. When the police called back, Miyano assured them that the prior call had been a mistake. The authorities never followed up again. The boys then punished Furuta for calling the police, dousing her legs in lighter fluid, and setting her on fire. On January 4, 1989, Junko Furuta's captors finally murdered her. The boys allegedly became enraged when she beat them at a game of mahong and tortured her to death. Scared of being charged with murder, they dumped her body in a 55-gallon drum, filled it with concrete, and dropped it on a cement truck. And for a while, they thought they would never be caught. Two weeks later, the police arrested Miyano and Ogura on a separate gang rape charge. During Miyano's interrogation, the police mentioned an open murder investigation. Believing that the authorities were referring to the murder of Junko Furuta and that Ogura must have confessed to the crime, Miyano told the police where they could find Furuta's body. In the end, the case that the police had been referencing had been unrelated to Furuta, and Miyano had unwittingly turned himself in for her murder. 
Within days, all four boys were in custody. But despite the mountain of evidence against them and their grisly torture of Junko Furuta, the boys received shockingly light sentences. Hiroshi Miyano was sentenced to 20 years. Shinji Minato received a term of five to nine years. Joe Ogura was sentenced to five to 10 years. And Yasushi Watanabe received a term of five to seven years. Since they were teenagers at the time of Junko Furuta's murder, their youth was linked to their light sentences. Though it is widely believed that their connections to the Yakuza also had something to do with it. Had the case been heard elsewhere, or had the boys been just a couple of years older, they would have likely been dealt capital punishments. Instead, all four of Furuta's killers were eventually released from prison. It's believed that Watanabe is the only one who has not reoffended since his release. To this day, many in Japan feel that justice has not been served in Furuta's case. And tragically, it doesn't seem like that will ever happen. Starting at a very early age, Susan Smith suffered unspeakable tragedy. Her father killed himself when she was just six years old, and she tried to follow suit at age 13. After her mother remarried, Smith's new stepfather began to molest her. Plagued by lifelong trauma, she married David Smith at 19 to start a family of her own. But in 1994, she destroyed her own family when she murdered her children. David and Susan Smith had a rocky relationship plagued by mutual infidelity. Meanwhile, David had no idea that she suffered from depression and dependent personality disorder. He also didn't know that his wife had been dumped by a wealthy South Carolina man because he didn't want kids. This is what prompted Susan Smith to drown her own children. One day in October 1994, Susan Smith's kids, three-year-old Michael and 14-month-old Alexander, joined her for a drive. But then, she purposefully rolled her car into John D. Long Lake in Union County, South Carolina, and left them to die. What's more, she told police that a black man had carjacked her with the children inside. But eventually, her lies came crashing down and the horrible truth about what happened to Susan Smith's children was revealed. Born on September 26, 1971, in Union, South Carolina, Susan Lee Vaughn was the youngest of three children and the only girl. Tragedy struck in 1977 when her father, Harry Ray, committed suicide. Susan navigated that grief by keeping his coin collection and an audio recording of her father's voice, but tried to kill herself at 13. When her mother, Linda, married Beverly Russell Jr., it seemed the family's luck was looking up. A divorced father of three, Russell was a thriving stockbroker and a member of both South Carolina's Republican community and the Christian coalition. At home, however, he was molesting his 15-year-old stepdaughter, fondling her breasts and genitals. Susan told her high school guidance counselor and her mother about the abuse in 1987 when she was 16. Linda confronted her husband about it. He swore to never do it again and agreed to family therapy, but then kept abusing Susan, who revealed as much in February 1988. Later that year, she attempted suicide yet again. Working part-time at a Winn-Dixie supermarket, Susan was overwhelmed after an older married co-worker broke off an affair with her and swallowed an overdose of aspirin in an attempt at self-harm. Doctors diagnosed her with an adjustment disorder and blamed her behavior on stress. In 1989, Susan Vaughn told her psychiatrist that her affair with her stepfather was consensual. Susan said she wasn't happy about her mother receiving all the male attention. She would ultimately find a partner in David Smith, a fellow Wynn Dixie supermarket worker who was raised a Jehovah's Witness by strict parents. They got married after only about a year of dating. The 19-year-old bride was already two months pregnant with her first son, Michael, while her 20-year-old groom lost a brother to Crohn's disease and had his father attempt suicide within a year. 
They both came from families tormented by tragedy, but their own family would prove to be an unhappy one as well. Almost as soon as they were wed, the Smiths would begin relentlessly arguing and cheating on each other. Susan Smith's most intense extramarital affair was with a newfound employee at Conso Products in 1993. She began sleeping with her boss's son, Tom Finlay, in January 1994. But the rich, handsome, 27 years old broke things off with her in October. Writing Smith a letter clarifying he wasn't ready for a relationship involving kids. On October 25th, they had a particularly upsetting conversation. Finlay recalled Smith being upset because David knew, or so she thought, some information that he was going to make public that upset her. It's unclear just what this was. While it would later be revealed that Smith had continued having sexual relations with her former stepfather. Then, after insulting Finlay by claiming she slept with his father, he asked her to leave. Three hours later, she decided that if Finlay didn't want kids, she was going to get her own children out of the picture. Just three hours later, Susan Smith put her kids in her 1990 Mazda protege and set out for a drive. As she approached John D. Long Lake, she rolled her car straight into the water, then fled the scene and left her two children to drown. She then reported her car stolen and her children missing, even pretending that a black man had carjacked her and abducted her sons. For nine days, she went on television, pleading tearfully for their safe return. But on November 3rd, with police suspicious of her flimsy story, Smith finally relented and confessed about what she'd done. Her trial began soon after. Smith's defense attorney, David Bruck, argued that her actions were rooted in mental illness, spurred by the suicide of her father, sexual abuses, and emotional rejections. Lead prosecutor Thomas Pope painted a very different picture. He claimed Smith was a murderous manipulator who killed her children to regain Finley's affections. Apparently unconvinced by Smith's defense, the jury deliberated for two and a half hours on July 22nd, 1995, and quickly found her guilty. Convicted of two counts of first-degree murder, Susan Smith was sentenced to life in prison. Today, Susan Smith is incarcerated at Leith Correctional Institution in Greenwood, South Carolina. Her behavior behind bars has only made her more infamous, as she's been caught smoking marijuana and sleeping with a correctional officer. She broke her decades-long silence in 2015 via a letter. It has been hard to listen to lie after lie and not be able to defend myself, the letter read. It's frustrating to say the least. The thing that hurts me the most is that people think that I hurt my children in order to be with a man. That is so far from the truth. There was no motive, as it was not even a planned event. I was not in my right mind. Even now, Susan Smith maintains that it was only a temporary, albeit violent, break from her normal mental state that caused her to harm her children. Though the court of public opinion has largely sided with the prosecution, the state will have to actually consider Smith's pleas in 2024, when she'll be eligible for parole. In 1991, Shonda Scherer was a bubbly 12-year-old attending Hazelwood Middle School in New Albany, Indiana. She was, by all accounts, a normal girl who made friends easily and had fun at school dances. But it was one such dance that set in motion a chain of events that would soon bring Shonda Shara's life to a gruesome, torturous end at the hands of four teenage girls. Shonda Shara met classmate Amanda Heverin at Hazelwood in 1991, soon after moving to the area with her recently divorced mother from Kentucky. Shonda and Heverin became fast friends and then romantic partners. In October of that year, the pair attended a school dance together. There, Scherer and Hevrin were confronted by 16-year-old Melinda Loveless, who had previously been dating Hevrin for more than a year and was now extremely jealous of this new pairing. Loveless then threatened Scherer in public and soon even talked about killing the 12-year-old. At this point, 
Sharer's mother transferred her to Our Lady of Perpetual Help Catholic School in order to protect her. Unfortunately, that did nothing to stop the horrific events that would soon unfold. On the cold winter night of January 10, 1992, Loveless enlisted three friends, Lori Tackett, 17, Hope Rippey, 15, and Tony Lawrence, 15, to help her take her revenge on Shanda Sharer. The foursome drove to where Shara was spending the weekend with her father. The girls used the pretense that they were taking Shara to see Hevron as the excuse for their visit. Shonda told the girls to return after her parents were asleep, which they did. The girls then took Shara into their car and told her they were going to drive her to the meeting place at the witch's castle, an isolated and abandoned house that served as a local teen hangout. In the back seat, Melinda Loveless was hiding under a blanket with a knife. The ringleader and jealous lover soon leapt out from under the blanket and threatened to slit Shara's throat if she didn't confess to stealing Hevron away from her. In tears and fearful for her life, Shara tried to respond but to no avail. Loveless then convinced the other girls to take Shara to a remote location where there would be no one else around for miles. The three other girls assumed Loveless was simply going to scare Shara into breaking up with Hevron. They were dead wrong. For seven hours, the four girls brutally tortured Shonda Sharer before ultimately killing her. First, they took Sharer to a remote trash dump near a logging road in a densely forested area. Loveless and Tackett stripped off Sharer's clothes and proceeded to punch her repeatedly. Loveless hit the victim's face with her knee until she bled profusely from her mouth. Meanwhile, Lawrence and Rippy stayed behind in Tackett's car. That torture wasn't enough to satiate the older girls. They then tried to slit Shara's throat, but the knife was too dull. Instead, they stabbed her in the chest and strangled her with a rope before throwing her in the trunk of the car, thinking she was dead. They then went to Tackett's house to clean up and drink sodas, before realizing that their victim, now screaming in the trunk, was still alive. Tackett proceeded to stab Sharer several more times before driving off once more with Loveless to beat and sodomize Sharer with a tire iron. When they returned to Tackett's house, she laughingly described what had just happened to Rippe. Finally, in the early morning hours, the torturers stopped at a gas station and bought a two-liter bottle of Pepsi, which they quickly emptied and refilled with gasoline. Again, driving to a remote location, the girls hauled their still-alive victim. Now only able to whimper mommy out of the trunk, wrapped her in a blanket, and poured the gasoline on her. Then they lit Shanda Sharer on fire and drove off. Just to be sure their work was finished, Loveless had them return a few minutes later to pour some more gasoline on her, watch her writhe in agony, and finally confirm that she was dead. As the four girls ate breakfast at McDonald's just after the killing, the four girls laughed as they compared their sausage breakfast to Shanda Sharer's burnt corpse. Later that morning, two hunters found the body. That same day, the girls started talking. Loveless told Heverin and another friend the whole story, but had them promise to keep their mouths shut. But that night, Lawrence and Rippy went straight to the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office with their parents and spilled the whole story. By the next day, all four girls were in custody. All four girls were tried as adults and accepted plea bargains in order to avoid the death penalty. Lawrence and Rippy, younger, less involved in the torture, and more forthcoming with authorities, received lighter sentences, with Lawrence getting 20 years and Rippy getting 50, shortened to 35 on appeal. The former was released in 2000 after serving nine years, while the latter served 14 and got out in 2006. Meanwhile, Tackett and Loveless both received 60-year sentences. Loveless, the one angry with Scherer and the ringleader behind the murder, naturally received a longer sentence than the two younger girls. But why would Tackett take so much to the killing and earn herself the longer sentence as well? Tackett grew up in a strict religious household where normal teenager things were not welcome behaviors. As a way of rebelling against her parents, 
The youngster shaved her head and started to engage in occult practices. Tackett told people in one interview that, I didn't know Shonda at all. I didn't go into that evening knowing anything was going to happen. Wanting anything to happen, I didn't. Peer pressure. That's all it was. It spiraled out of control way too fast. It's something that should have never happened. Furthermore, in an interview on Dr. Phil, the convicted killer explained why she thinks people kill. My opinion is that they kill to feel superior, or high on the victim's fear, and they're thirsty for the spill of blood. Dr. Phil asked Lori's mother and sister if they agreed with that statement, and they said yes. Her mom said that her daughter believed it was her destiny that she would murder someone in cold blood and spend the rest of her life in prison. Her prediction was partly true. While Tackett did have a hand in killing Shonda Scherer, she was released from prison in January 2018. Tackett's motives aside, what would drive 16-year-old Loveless to mastermind such a brutal murder? As Shonda Scherer's mother, Jacques Vaught, said in a 2012 interview, I had many times said if you want to see as close to a person who has absolutely nothing inside of them, look into Melinda's eyes because there's nothing there. That said, Loveless did have a difficult childhood. Her father, a Vietnam veteran, sexually abused her and her siblings when they were younger and experts have attributed her anger to that abuse, for which he was later arrested and convicted. But in prison, it seems as though Loveless has found some measure of escape from the cycle of violence and abuse. An Indiana program called Indiana Canine Assistant Network has been helping Loveless. Behind bars, she trains puppies to be assistance dogs for disabled people. One of the dog breeders who supplies Indiana with pups is a burn victim, much like Shonda Scherer was. The breeder convinced Vaught to watch a video of Loveless grown up and see what she does in prison for the program. I was really taken aback, Vaught said after watching. I saw someone almost reborn. She was sincere. She was compassionate. I think the Indiana Canine Assistant Network program allows her to have something in her life that she can show love back to. And there's never betrayal on either side. Vaught did something remarkable after seeing her daughter's killer at work. She donated a puppy named Angel for Loveless to train in prison. The grieving mother said she did it to honor her little girl, who she still thinks about every day. It's my choice to make. She's my child. If you don't let good things come from bad things, nothing gets better. And I know what my child would want. My child would want this. Loveless, for her part, feels as if Vaught is helping her to overcome her past. She helped me to heal, forgive, and grow, whether she wanted that or not. She did a good thing. I would thank her. I couldn't thank her enough. Angel is in good hands, and I'm doing it for Shonda. No one could believe that mild-mannered Charlie Brandt had mutilated his wife and niece until they discovered his grisly past. Charlie Brandt always seemed like a normal guy, until one bloody night in September 2004. At the time, Hurricane Ivan was barreling toward the Florida Keys, where the 47-year-old Brandt lived with his wife, Terry, 46. They evacuated their home on Big Pine Key on September 2nd to stay with their niece, 37-year-old Michelle Jones, in Orlando. Michelle was close to Terry, her maternal aunt, and was excited to welcome her and her husband as house guests. Michelle was likewise close with her mother, Mary Lowe, with whom she spoke on the phone almost every day. When Michelle stopped answering her phone after the night of September 13th, Mary Lowe grew concerned and asked Michelle's friend, Debbie Knight, to go to the house and check on things. When Knight arrived, the front door was locked and there was no answer so she made her way to the garage. There was a garage door with almost all glass. So you could see in, Knight recalled. I was in shock. There inside the garage, Charlie Brandt was hanging from the rafters. But Charlie Brandt's death was just one of the horrible deaths that had happened inside that house. When authorities arrived at the house, 
they found a scene that looked like something out of a slasher movie. Charlie Brandt had hung himself with a bedsheet. Terry's body was on the couch inside, been stabbed seven times in the chest. Michelle's body was in her bedroom. She had been decapitated, her head placed next to her body, and someone had removed her heart. It was just a nice home, lead investigator Rob Hemmert recalled. All of those nice decorations and the aroma of her home was masked by death. The smell of death. Yet, with all this bloodshed, there were no signs of a struggle or forced entry, and the house was locked from the inside. Thus, with two people killed and one having killed himself, authorities quickly determined that Charlie Brandt had killed his wife and niece before committing suicide. But no one seemed to expect anything like this from Charlie Brandt, Mary Lowe said of her brother-in-law, who she'd known for 17 years, when they described what had happened to Michelle. It was even beyond description. Likewise, Lisa Emmons, one of Michelle's best friends, couldn't believe it. He was just very quiet and reserved, she said of Charlie. He would just sit back and observe. Michelle and I used to call him eccentric. Not only did everyone find Charlie Brandt nice and agreeable, they all felt like he and Terry had the perfect marriage. The inseparable pair did everything together, fishing and boating near their home, traveling and so on. No one had any explanation for Charlie Brandt's behavior. Then, his older sister came forward. Angela Brandt was two years older than Charlie, and she harbored a dark secret from their Indiana childhood that no one knew about until she told her story. In an interrogation with Rob Hemmert, Angela cried before stealing her nerves and telling her story. It was January 3rd, 1971. At 9 or 10 p.m., Angela said, we had just gotten a color TV. We were all sitting around watching the FBI with Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. after the TV show was over. I went and got in bed to read my book like I always did before I went to sleep. Meanwhile, Angela and Charlie's pregnant mom, Ilse, was drawing a bath and their dad, Herbert, was shaving. Then, Angela heard loud noises, so loud that she thought they were firecrackers. Then I heard my father yell, Charlie, don't, or Charlie, stop. And my mom was just screaming. The last thing I heard my mom say was, Angela, call the police. Charlie, 13 at the time, then came into Angela's room holding a gun. He aimed a gun at her and pulled the trigger, but all they heard was a click. The gun was out of bullets. Charlie and Angela then began to fight, and he started to strangle his sister which was when she noticed the glazed look in his eyes. That terrifying look disappeared after a moment, and Charlie, as if emerging from a trance, asked, What am I doing? What he had just done was walk into parents' bathroom, shoot his father once in the back, and then shoot his mother several times, leaving him wounded and killing her. At the hospital in Fort Wayne just after the incident, Herbert said he had no idea why his son would do this. At the time he shot his parents, Charlie Brandt seemed like a normal kid. He did well in school and showed no signs of underlying psychological stress. The courts, which couldn't charge him with any criminal offense, given his age, ordered that he undergo many psychiatric evaluations and even spend more than a year in a psychiatric hospital. Before his father secured his release, but none of the psychiatrists ever found any mental illness or any explanation at all as to why he'd shot his family. The records were sealed because of Charlie's young age, and Herbert told his other children to keep things quiet and moved the family to Florida. They buried the incident and put it behind them. Anyone who knew the secret never told, and Charlie seemed fine afterward. But it seems he had been harboring dark urges all along. After he killed his wife and niece in 2004, authorities investigated Charlie's house on Big Pine Key. Inside, they found a medical poster displaying the female anatomy. There were also medical books and anatomy books, as well as a newspaper clipping that showed a human heart, all of which recalled some of the ways in which Charlie had mutilated Michelle's body. 
Searches of his internet history revealed websites focused on necrophilia and violence against women. They also found lots of Victoria's secret catalogs, which proved especially troubling after they learned that Victoria's secret is the nickname Charlie had given to Michelle. Knowing what he did to Michelle and then finding those things, Hemmert said, it all started to make sense. Investigators believed that Charlie had become infatuated with Michelle and that his desires had taken a murderous turn. Hemmert, for one, believes that Charlie Brandt had always had these kinds of deadly desires and that he was probably a serial killer. It's just that his other crimes never came to light. Authorities believe that he may have been responsible for at least two other murders, including one in 1989 and 1995. Both murders involved mutilations of women in a similar method to Michelle's murder. The Canadian porn actor Luca Magnata, who suspected of murdering and dismembering a Chinese student and mailing his body parts to Canada's top political parties, was reading about himself on the internet when he was arrested Monday at a cafe in Berlin, Germany. There was a horrid stench coming out of the suitcase. It had been there for days now. The janitor had noticed it every time he swept out in the alleyway behind the apartment building. Up until then, he'd been able to ignore it. But the smell from inside was getting worse and worse. A choking, sickly stench like a pig roast left out to rot, but nothing could have prepared him for what he found inside, a man's severed torso with the limbs torn off. The other parts of the dead man would eventually turn up throughout the late spring of 2012, but they would be found nowhere near that apartment in Montreal. His left foot would show up in a package wrapped up by the Canada Post, delivered to the offices of Canada's Prime Minister. The package carrying his left hand, on its way to the Liberal Party, would be intercepted just in time. But no one would be able to stop the right side of his body from reaching its destinations. Two elementary schools full of children in Vancouver, British Columbia, both schools would start their day by opening up packages of severed, decomposing human remains. It didn't take long to figure out who'd done it. Luca Magnata, after all, had filmed his own murder. He'd uploaded an 11-minute video of himself, hacking Jun Lin to pieces onto a website called bestgore.com, for the whole world to see. So the mystery wasn't as much a question of who had done it as it was a question of why? Luca Magnata was born Eric Newman in Ontario in 1982. The new name was one he chose himself a sort of reinvention meant to purge bad memories. He said there was some messed up stuff that happened to him when he was a kid. Nina Arsenault, one of Magnata's few friends, has said, Magnata, she said, was so disturbed with whatever had hurt him that he'd break into fits of punching himself in the face. It's hard to say what memory was torturing him so horribly. Perhaps it was that his parents abandoned him at age 10 and left him to live with his brutal and domineering grandmother. Or it might have been something from his teenage years, when he was young and bisexual in a small Ontario town, that didn't make that easy. Or maybe it was just madness. Magnata, after all, had inherited paranoid schizophrenia from his father, and had started hearing voices at the age of 18. Whatever it was that had left him disturbed, Luca Magnata had done everything in his power to erase Eric Newman. He'd rebuilt his whole face through plastic surgery and thrown himself into a new life as a male escort and minor porn star. Even his family was worried. As his own aunt later said, he was a time bomb waiting to explode. Jun Len just wanted a friend. He was a 33-year-old international student from China who hadn't quite been in Montreal for a year by the time of the spring of 2012, when Luca Magnata, now 29, contacted him, he was just happy to have a friend. He wanted to find someone with something in common, one of Lynn's friends later recalled. He didn't deserve this. Magnata claimed that the two met on the night of May 24th, after Lynn responded to a Craigslist ad that the former had posted in hopes of finding someone interested in sex and bondage. 
That night at 9 p.m., June Line sent one final text to a friend. The next time anyone saw him was in a video, uploaded to bestscore.com the next day, carrying the title One Lunatic, One Ice Pick. As the video revealed, Jun Lin had been stripped naked and tied to a bed frame. While the music of New Order blared through the speakers, Magnata hacked him apart with an ice pick and a kitchen knife. He then filmed himself both sexually violating and dismembering the body, while also allowing a dog to chew on the body, and allegedly even eating parts of it himself. Police have claimed that cannibalism is evident in an extended version of the video that they reviewed. Luca Magnata was already being investigated for horrific acts of violence for more than a year before he killed Jun Lin. A group of online sleuths had been working together via Facebook to hunt down Magnata because he had uploaded video of himself killing animals. A year and a half before killing Lin, Luca Magnata had uploaded another video entitled One Boy One Kittens in which he suffocated two tabby kittens to death with a vacuum and a plastic bag. Since then, the online sleuths had amassed an incredible amount of information to bring Magnata down. They'd pulled metadata from his animal torture pictures, found evidence about where he was hiding, and shared it all with the police, trying to stop him before he killed a human being. It hadn't been hard for them to track Magnata down. He'd done everything he could to build up his online presence. He'd created Wikipedia pages about himself twice, created his own fake fan pages, and spread rumors that he was dating serial killer Carla Homolka. The sleuths hunting Magnata speculated that he'd likewise killed cats for the attention. There's this unwritten rule of the internet. It's called Rule Zero. And it's you don't mess with cats, one of the sleuths told Rolling Stone. Another added, what better way to get famous than to F with cats? But when these sleuths contacted the police, there wasn't much of a response. As one of the vigilantes recalled, I'm told it's just cats. They brushed me aside. What else could I have done? In the end, I told them this guy is going to turn around and kill somebody. Of course, Luca Magnata did turn around and kill somebody. And once the video of Jun Lin's death was confirmed authentic, police began hunting for the killer. After the janitor at Magnata's apartment building found the torso, with papers identifying the victim nearby, police checked the building's security footage and saw their victim and their killer entering the building just before the murder. It didn't take long for police to arrive at Magnata's apartment in the building, where they found blood on the mattress, bathtub, in the refrigerator, and elsewhere. He wasn't there, but they had their killer and after matching the torso remains, with those that had been mailed all over Canada. Police also fully knew what had become of their victim. By that point, Magnata had fled to Paris under his own name, easily allowing authorities to follow his trail. He then took a bus to Berlin, but police kept on his trail and would soon take him down. They found him in an internet cafe in Berlin on June 4th. When the police came in, Magnata was Googling his own name reveling in his own fame. Something forced me to do it. It just gave me this weird energy, Luca Magnata told a psychiatrist while waiting for his trial to begin. Something just happened in my brain. Magnata said that he and Lin were lovers, sharing a night together when a black car outside filled him with a conviction that Jun Lin was a secret agent. Tie him up. Cut it. He heard a voice tell him, he said. Do it. He's from the government. Then, after he'd slit Lin's throat and chopped up his body, Magnata said that the voices told him, give it back to the government, hence mailing the body parts to government offices. But it's of course hard to say if Magnata is telling the truth. The details and organization of the crimes, another psychiatrist said, show that Magnata was having anything but disorganized thought. Instead, other analysts said that Magnata knowingly committed the crime for the attention, and that for him. The problem was simply that negative attention is better than no attention at all. We may never know for sure what went wrong inside the mind of Luca Magnata. His jury, though, didn't accept his insanity defense. 
In December 2014, they found him guilty on all counts and sentenced him to life in prison. But for the family of Jun Lin, Luca Magnata's punishment will surely never be enough. I will never see his smiling face, said the victim's father, or hear about his new accomplishments, or hear his laugh. Jun Lin's birthday is on December 30th, and he will never be there for his birthday or ours. A quiet spring night in Kansas City's historic Hyde Park in 1988 was shattered when a man wearing nothing but a dog collar around his neck leaped from a second-story window of a Robert Burdella's house where he was being held captive. He crashed to the ground and ran to a nearby meter maid who called the police. Police secured a search warrant and proceeded to discover a cavalcade of horrors inside this unassuming house. Opening a second-story closet, they discovered a human skull, as well as human vertebrae, marked from where they had been cut with a bone saw. In the backyard, they discovered another human head buried in the ground, partly decomposed. When they ventured into the basement, they found large barrels stained with blood, as well as the personal belongings of two missing people and a stack of Polaroid photos depicting naked men being sexually assaulted and tortured. They also found a stenographer's pad meticulously detailing the abduction, torture, rape, and murder of six young men from around the area. This house, 4315 Charlotte Street, belonged to the Kansas City Butcher, one of the most deranged serial killers in history. Born Robert Andrew Berdella Jr. on January 31, 1949, in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. The man who would become this terrifying killer grew up in a deeply religious Roman Catholic family in the early 1950s. From a young age, Robert Berdella was a loner. With his severe nearsightedness, high blood pressure, and speech impediment, he was an easy target for bullies in his neighborhood. This included his father, who would physically and verbally abuse the young boy for his lack of athleticism. However, by his mid-teens, Bordella had begun to gain some confidence. He had realized that he was gay, and though he kept this a closely guarded secret, it gave him a level of self-assurance. This confidence manifested itself in a rude and condescending attitude, especially towards women, that he would hold for the rest of his life. In 1967, Robert Bordella graduated from high school and started attending the Kansas City Art Institute. In college, he was finally able to express himself and was open with his homosexuality. Though he displayed artistic talent, he quickly got caught up in drug use and low-level drug dealing. It was also during this time that he began torturing and killing animals. After he received harsh backlash from the administration of the Institute for an Art Piece where he tortured, killed, and cooked a duck, Berdella left college and moved into a house in the Hyde Park neighborhood of Kansas City, Missouri. Using the contacts he made through his extensive pen pal relationships from his lonely childhood, as well as his knowledge of art, Berdella opened a store called Bob's Bazaar Bazaar, where he sold art, jewelry, and antiques from around the world. Throughout the 1970s and early 80s, Robert Berdella spent much of his time with male prostitutes, drug addicts, petty criminals, and runaways that he claimed to be mentoring. In reality, he was engaging in manipulative sexual relationships with young men. Berdella used his money and influence to create an imbalance of power in his relationships he would use to control these young runaways, many of whom had been prostitutes or had been sexually abused. Then. In 1984, the Kansas City Butcher claimed his first victim, Jerry Howell. Howell was the 19-year-old son of Paul Howell, one of Berdella's acquaintances from his art-dealing business. On July 5th that year, Berdella offered to drive the young Howell to a dance competition at a neighboring town. On the way, Robert Berdella plied the youth with alcohol and then drugged him with Valium and Asipromazine. He tied Howell to his bed for 28 hours, during which he repeatedly drugged, tortured, 
raped, and violated the youth with foreign objects. Ignoring his desperate pleas for Berdella to stop, he continued his torture until Howell finally asphyxiated from a combination of his gag, the drugs, and his own vomit. After Howell died, Robert Berdella butchered his body, leaving the corpse upside down overnight with cuts in major arteries to drain the blood, and then dismembering the body with a bone saw. He then placed the pieces of the dismembered body in separate garbage bags, along with assorted other trash, and left them out on the curb for garbage men to take away. Throughout this process, Berdella kept detailed notes of how he raped and tortured Howell on a stenographer's pad, something he would continue to do for all his victims. His next victim was one of the drifters that Berdella had taken care of and exploited for years, Robert Sheldon. The 23-year-old man arrived on Berdella's doorstep on April 10, 1985, begging Berdella to let him stay there. Berdella was not attracted to Sheldon, and though he did not rape him, he did restrain and torture him. With Sheldon, Berdella began his experiments on using chemicals to weaken his victims, leaving them helpless to his machinations. He bound Sheldon's wrists with piano wire in an attempt to permanently damage the nerves there, put drain cleaner in his eyes, and filled his ears with caulk. He also placed needles under Sheldon's fingernails. When workmen were scheduled to come to Bob Berdella's house, he decided to suffocate Sheldon and dissect his corpse before disposing of it. The following June, Robert Berdella committed another brutal murder of one of his runaway acquaintances when he found Mark Wallace attempting to sleep in his shed. Berdella drugged Wallace and subjected him to high-voltage electrical shocks and stuck hypodermic needles into his back. Wallace died after a few days of this unrelenting torture, and his body was also dismembered and disposed of. The next month, another of Berdella's acquaintances contacted him wondering if he could stay at his house, Walter James Ferris. When Ferris arrived at Berdella's house, he tied him to his bed and tortured him by shocking his genitals with 7,700 volts of electricity for two days until he died from the abuse. The next year, Berdella ran into Todd Stoops, a former male prostitute who had stayed with Berdella in the past at a nearby park. Berdella brought Stoops back to his place to grab lunch. There, Berdella drugged Stoops and kept him trapped in his house for weeks. He attempted to turn Stoops into a submissive sex slave, trying to incapacitate him through electrical shocks to the eyes and by injecting drain cleaner into his larynx in an unsuccessful effort to render him mute while repeatedly raping and sexually assaulting him. Stoops eventually died of blood loss after his anal cavity was ruptured by Berdella's fist. In 1987, Berdella continued this attempt with 20-year-old Larry Wayne Person, an acquaintance he made while working at his shop. The Kansas City Butcher decided to kill him after Pearson jokingly referred to his practice of robbing gay men in Wichita. He drugged Pearson and continued his torture practices aimed at incapacitating his victims, binding, electric shocking, and injecting drain cleaner into his larynx. He also broke one of Pearson's hands with a metal bar. After six weeks of rape and torture, Pearson finally snapped and bit deeply into Berdella's penis during an act of forced fellatio. Berdella then beat and strangled Pearson to death. On March 29, 1988, Berdella abducted his last victim, a 22-year-old male prostitute named Christopher Bryson, who he had solicited for sex. Once he arrived at Berdella's house, he knocked the prostitute unconscious with a metal bar and tied him up. Bryson was subjected to the same torture and abuse methods as Berdella's previous victims. But Bryson knew how to gain Berdella's trust, eventually persuading Berdella to tie his hands in front of him rather than to the bed. Then, when Berdella accidentally left a box of matches in the room, Bryson grabbed them and burned through his ropes, leading to his dramatic escape through the window. After collecting evidence from the house and questioning the suspected killer, Robert Berdella was quickly arrested and charged with the murders of six men. 
Berdella accepted a deal where he pleaded guilty and revealed everything about the vile murders in exchange for life without parole, avoiding the death penalty. He died of a heart attack while incarcerated at the Missouri State Penitentiary on October 8, 1992, at the age of 43. So ended the life of the Kansas City Butcher, one of the most horrific serial killers in modern history. On the evening of February 21st, 2001, Ashton Kutcher was getting ready for a date. That night, he had plans to go out with a 22-year-old woman named Ashley Ellerin. But when he arrived at her Los Angeles home to pick her up, she didn't answer the door. Kutcher peered in the window to see if she was inside and saw what he thought was a red wine stain on the carpet. This didn't surprise him, as he'd attended a rowdy party there a few days earlier. When Ellerin failed to appear after several minutes, the young actor assumed he'd been stood up. However, Ashton Kutcher later learned that it was not red wine staining Ellerin's floor. It was blood. The next morning, Ellerin's roommate came home to find her body. She had been stabbed 47 times. Investigators later identified her killer as Michael Gargiulo, also known as the Hollywood Ripper and the Boy Next Door Killer. However, Gargiulo wouldn't face justice for his heinous crimes until 2019, nearly two decades after he brutally murdered Ashley Ellerin. Ashley Ellerin was born on July 16, 1978. She grew up in New Jersey after her family moved from California, and although she was the new girl at her school, it did not affect her confidence. According to her childhood friend, Carolyn Mernick, who wrote the book The Hot One, a memoir of friendship, sex, and murder about Ellerin's death. Ellerin was the kind of girl who looked like she knew how to have fun. I liked Ashley right away for a million unquantifiable reasons that, looking back, I can only describe as chemistry and timing. What else was there, really? She wrote. She had shiny dark hair and a round face, and she didn't rush to try to get in with the popular girls or make too much of the curiosity she aroused by being new at school that year in the fourth grade. But while Ellerin and Mernick became fast friends in childhood, they gradually drifted apart after the Ellerins moved back to California during their sophomore year of high school. Although Mernick and Ellerin lost contact for several years, they reconnected around 2000. Ellerin was an aspiring fashion designer and worked at a local strip club Though she confessed to Mernick that, on occasion, there were arrangements that happened in hotels, too. Mernick also heard stories that Ellerin had been partying often and trying different drugs. Mernick said it was as if they were speaking different languages, with Ellerin's being the language of youth, risk, and sexual possibility. It was around this time that Ashley Ellerin started seeing Ashton Kutcher. Kutcher later testified that he first met Ellerin at a friend's birthday party. He was dating someone else, but he introduced Ellerin to one of his friends. Neither relationship worked out, though, and eventually, Kutcher and Ellerin made plans to attend a post-Grammys party together. They scheduled the date for February 21, 2001, the night Ashley Ellerin died. That fateful night, Ashton Kutcher last talked to Ellerin at 8. 24 p.m. He told her that he was running late, but she assured him it was no problem because she still needed to dry her hair. When Kutcher called Ellerin again around 10 p.m. to let her know he was on his way, he couldn't reach her. He redialed her number multiple times, but she never answered. At 10.45 p.m., he arrived at her house in Hollywood to find the front door locked. I knocked on the door. There was no answer. Knocked again, and once again, no answer. Kutcher later testified in court. At this point, I pretty well assumed she had left for the night, and that I was late, and she was upset. That's when he peered in through the window, and saw what he thought was a red wine stain on the carpet. I didn't really think anything of it, he said. Kutcher then left. The next morning, Ellerin's roommate, Jennifer DeSisto, returned home to find her body lying near the bathroom door. 
She initially believed that Ellerin was playing some kind of practical joke. So she moved closer and noticed that Ellerin was covered in so much blood that it had matted her hair and stained the carpet red. DeSisto called the police immediately, and investigators quickly determined that her death was a homicide. The question remained, though, who was the killer? It took police years to track down Ashley Ellerin's murderer. In 2008, a man named Michael Gargiulo was arrested after he violently attacked his neighbor, Michelle Murphy. Detectives later connected him to the deaths of Ellerin and two other women. The press gave Gargiulo several nicknames, including the Chiller Killer and the Hollywood Ripper. However, the one that stuck was the Boy Next Door Killer because he lived near his victims, stalked them, and attacked them in their own homes. In fact, Gargiulo had first met Ashley Ellerin when he spotted her trying to fix a flat tire in front of her house. He offered to help her change it, and then continued to show up at her apartment to repair other objects. He came by so frequently that Ellerin's roommate came to believe he was stalking her. Still, Ellerin was the kind of woman who wanted to see the good in people. Her friends described her as an amazing person who would make friends with everyone. Detective Tom Small, who worked on Ellerin's case, noted, probably someone came to the door and the rest is history. She knew the guy, and according to the people who knew her, if she knew you, she would let you in. Gargiulo likely decided to act when he found Ellerin home alone on the night of February 21st. Perhaps he made a move and was rejected, or maybe he simply wanted to kill. Regardless of his motive, however, Gargiulo stabbed Ellerin 47 times. The wounds were so severe that she was nearly decapitated. But Gargiulo had managed to get away with the murder, at least for a while. Michael Gargiulo likely carried out his first murder in 1993 before going on to kill Ellerin in 2001. Four years later, he struck again, this time stabbing his neighbor Maria Bruno to death in her home in El Monte. When her body was found, investigators noticed that her breasts had been cut off and the implants removed. Then, in 2008, Gargiulo attacked Murphy in her Santa Monica apartment. She managed to fight him off, and he ran away, leaving a bloody trail behind him. After years of delayed trials, Michael Gargiulo was found guilty of Ashley Ellerin's murder in August 2019 and sentenced to death, largely thanks to the testimony of none other than Ashton Kutcher. When Issei Sagawa murdered, dismembered, and devoured Rene Hardevelt in 1981, he was fulfilling a dream 32 years in the making. Sagawa, who was born in Kobe, Japan, was studying comparative literature in Paris at the time of his crime. He was almost immediately arrested and sentenced to a psychiatric hospital. But after his extradition to Japan, he was able to check himself out of a different psychiatric hospital due to a legal loophole, and remains free to this day. In the years since, he has effectively made a living off his crime, and he's even become something of a minor celebrity in Japan. He has appeared on numerous talk shows and written manga novels that graphically depict killing and eating Hardevelt. He has even starred in soft-core porn reenactments, where he bites actors. And throughout his life, he has been chillingly unrepentant. When he discusses his crime, it's as if he believes it's the most natural thing in the world, and he plans to do it again. Issei Sagawa was born on April 26, 1949, and for as long as he can remember, he possessed cannibalistic urges and a fascination with eating human flesh. He remembered with fondness his uncle dressing up as a monster and lowering him and his brother into a stew pot for eating. He sought out fairy tales that involved humans being eaten, and his favorite was Hansel and Gretel. He even recalls noticing classmates' thighs in the first grade and thinking, yum, that looks delicious. He blames the media's representation of Western women, like Grace Kelly, for sparking his cannibalistic fantasies, equating it with what most people would call sexual desire. 
where other people dreamed of bedding these beautiful women. Sagawa dreamed of eating them. Issei Sagawa says, the reasons behind his cannibalistic tendencies can't be explained to or conceptualized by anyone who doesn't share his exact urges. It's simply a fetish, he said. For example, if a normal man fancied a girl, he'd naturally feel a desire to see her as often as possible, to be close to her, to smell her and kiss her, right? To me, eating is just an extension of that. Frankly, I can't fathom why everyone doesn't feel this urge to eat, to consume other people. He maintains, however, that he never thought of killing them, only gnawing on their flesh. He was always short and skinny, with legs that looked like pencils, he wrote in his best-selling book In the Fog. And he believed that at just under five feet tall, he was too repulsive to attract the kind of physical intimacy that would have tempered his desires. Although Sagawa did once attempt to see a psychiatrist for his urges at age 15, he found it unhelpful and retreated further into his isolated psyche. Then, in 1981, after repressing his desires for 32 years, he finally acted on them. Issei Sagawa had moved to Paris to study literature at the Sorbonne, a public research university. Once there, he said, his cannibalistic urges took over. Almost every night I would bring a prostitute home and then try to shoot them from behind, he wrote in in the fog. It became less about wanting to eat them, but more an obsession with the idea that I simply had to carry out this ritual of killing a girl no matter what. Eventually, he found the perfect victim. Renee Hardevelt was a Dutch student studying with Sagawa at the Sorbonne. Over time, Sagawa struck up a friendship with her, occasionally inviting her to his home for dinner. At some point, he gained her trust. He attempted to kill her once, unsuccessfully, before actually murdering her, the first time the gun misfired when her back was turned. Though most would take this as a sign to give up, it only pushed Sagawa further down his rabbit hole. It made me even more hysterical, and I knew that I simply had to kill her, he said. The very next night, he did. This time, the gun fired and Hardevelt was killed instantly. Sagawa only felt a moment of remorse before he became elated. I thought about calling an ambulance, he recalled. But then I thought, hang on, don't be stupid. You've been dreaming about this for 32 years, and now it's actually happening. Immediately after killing her, he raped her corpse and began cutting her open. The first thing I did was cut into her buttock. No matter how deep I cut, all I saw was the fat beneath the skin. It looked like corn, and it took a while to actually reach the red meat, Sagawa recalled. The moment I saw the meat, I tore a chunk off with my fingers and threw it into my mouth. It was truly a historical moment for me. Ultimately, he said his only regret was that he hadn't eaten her while she was alive. What I truly wished was to eat her living flesh, he said. Nobody believes me, but my ultimate intention was to eat her. Not necessarily to kill her. Two days after killing Hardevelt, Sagawa disposed of what remained of her body. He had eaten or frozen most of her pelvic region, so he put her legs, torso, and head into two suitcases and hailed a cab. The taxi dropped him off at the Bois de Boulogne Park, which had a secluded lake inside it. He had planned to drop the suitcases in it, but several people noticed the suitcases dripping blood and notified the French police. When police found Sagawa and questioned him, his response was a simple admission. I killed her to eat her flesh, he said. Issei Sagawa awaited his trial for two years in a French prison. When it was finally time for him to be tried, French judge Jean-Louis Bruguier declared him legally insane and unfit to stand trial, dropping the charges and ordering him to be held indefinitely in a mental institution. They then deported him back to Japan where he was supposed to spend the rest of his days in a Japanese mental hospital, but he didn't. Because the charges in France had been dropped, the court documents were sealed and couldn't be released to Japanese authorities. 
Therefore, the Japanese had no case against Issei Sagawa and no choice but to let him walk free. And on August 12, 1986, Issei Sagawa checked himself out of the Matsuzawa Psychiatric Hospital in Tokyo. He has been free ever since. Today, Issei Sagawa walks the streets of Tokyo where he lives, free to do as he pleases. A terrifying thought when one hears that the threat of life in prison hasn't done much to quell his urges. The desire to eat people becomes so intense around June, when women start wearing less and showing more skin, he said. Just today, I saw a girl with a really nice derriere on my way to the train station. When I see things like that, I think about wanting to eat someone again before I die. What I'm saying is, I can't bear the thought of leaving this life without ever tasting that derriere that I saw this morning, or her thighs. He continued, I want to eat them again while I'm alive, so that I can at least be satisfied when I die. He's even planned out how he will do it. I think either sukiyaki or shabu shabu lightly boiled thin slices is the best way to go, in order to really savor the natural flavor of the meat. In the meantime, however, Sagawa has refrained from cannibalism. But that hasn't stopped him from capitalizing on his crime. He wrote restaurant reviews for the Japanese magazine Spa and enjoyed success on a lecture circuit, talking about his urges and crime. And to date, he has published 20 books. His most recent book is called Extremely Intimate Fantasies of Beautiful Girls, and it is filled with pictures drawn by himself as well as by famous artists. I hope that people who read it will at least stop thinking of me as a monster, he said. Sagawa allegedly suffers from diabetes and suffered two heart attacks in 2015. He is now 72, lives with his brother in Tokyo, and continues to garner media attention. And in 2018, French filmmakers recorded the two talking. Sagawa's brother asks him, as your brother, would you eat me? The only response Sagawa gives is an empty stare and silence. Carla Homolka met Paul Bernardo at a hotel restaurant in 1987. She was 17 years old at the time and working as a volunteer at an animal hospital. Bernardo was 23. By 1989, the couple were engaged. They got married in 1991, but not before they raped several women and caused the death of 15-year-old Tammy Homolka and 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey. In December of 1990, Veterinary technician Carla Homolka stole a vial of sedatives from the office where she worked. One night, as her family hosted a dinner party, she drugged her 15-year-old sister, carried her to the basement, and presented her to her boyfriend Paul Bernardo as a virgin sacrifice. From there, the sadistic acts between Carla Homolka and Paul Bernardo only escalated. They began a torture spree that lasted years and resulted in the deaths of several teen girls in and around Toronto, including Homolka's sister, before they were finally caught in 1992. Together, they were known as the Ken and Barbie killers. When their crimes were discovered, Carla Homolka made a controversial deal with prosecutors and served 12 years in prison for manslaughter. While Paul Bernardo is still behind bars to this day, Homolka, however, got out on July 4, 2005, and has lived her life out of the spotlight ever since. But 30 years on, following the sensationalized trial and controversial plea deal, Carla Homolka today lives a completely different life. She settled comfortably in Quebec, where she is a part of a quiet community and volunteers at a local elementary school. It seems that Carla Homolka come a long way from her days as one half of the Ken and Barbie killers. Many experts believe that Carla Homolka always had sociopathic tendencies. Those experts assert that it wasn't until her late teens that Homolka's dangerous tendencies revealed themselves. In her early life, Homolka was, for all intents and purposes, a normal kid. Born May 4, 1970, she grew up in Ontario Canada in a well-adjusted family of five 
as the oldest of the three daughters. Her friends from school remember her as smart, attractive, popular, and an animal lover. Indeed, following her high school graduation, she began working at a local veterinary clinic. But then, on a fateful midsummer trip for work to a veterinary convention in Toronto in 1987, 17 year old Homolka met 23 year old Paul Bernardo. The two connected instantly and became inseparable. Carla Homolka and Paul Bernardo also developed a shared taste for sadomasochism, with Bernardo as the master and Homolka as the slave. Some believed that Homolka had been coerced by Bernardo to commit the heinous crimes that later landed her in prison. It has been asserted that Homolka was merely yet another one of Bernardo's victims. But still others believe that Carla Homolka entered into the relationship willingly and was every bit a sadistic criminal mastermind as he was. What can't be denied is that Carla Homolka willingly offered up her own sister to Bernardo. Bernardo had apparently been upset by the fact that Homolka had not been a virgin when they met. In order to make up for this, he allegedly ordered that Homolka bring him a girl who was a virgin, and Homolka decided upon her own sister, Tammy. On December 23, 1990, Carla Homolka's family hosted a holiday party. Earlier that morning, Homolka had stolen vials of sedatives from the veterinary office where she worked. That night, she spiked her sister's eggnog with Halcyon and brought her downstairs to the bedroom, where Bernardo was waiting. However, this wasn't the first time that Homolka had brought her sister to Bernardo. In July, she and Bernardo spiked the teenager's spaghetti dinner with Valium. But Bernardo had raped the younger sister for only a minute before she began to wake up. The Ken and Barbie killers were thus more careful this second time around, and Bernardo held a rag coated in halothane up to Tammy's face when she was brought into the bedroom that holiday night and raped her while she was unconscious. Likely due to the drugs, Tammy vomited whilst unconscious and then choked to death. In a panic, Bernardo and Homolka cleaned and clothed her body, laid her on the bed, and claimed that she had vomited in her sleep. Her death was consequently ruled an accident. Despite her family tragedy, Homolka and Bernardo were wed six months later in a lavish ceremony near Niagara Falls. Bernardo allegedly insisted that Homolka vow to love, honor, and obey him. Carla Homolka also agreed to provide Bernardo with young victims. Homolka gifted her husband with another 15-year-old girl, a pet shop worker whom Homolka had met through her veterinary work. On June 7, 1991, shortly after their wedding, Homolka invited the girl, known only as Jane Doe, to a girl's night out. As the couple had done with Tammy, Homolka spiked the young girl's drink and delivered her to Bernardo at the couple's new home. This time, however, Homolka raped the girl herself before Bernardo. Fortunately, the young woman survived the ordeal, though due to the drugs she didn't know what had happened to her until later. A week after the rape of Jane Doe, Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka found their penultimate victim, a 14-year-old girl named Leslie Mahaffey. Mahaffey had been walking home after dark one night when Bernardo noticed her from his car and pulled over. When Mahaffey stopped him to ask for a cigarette, he dragged her into his car and drove the couple's house. There, he and Homolka proceeded to repeatedly rape and torture Mahaffey while videotaping the entire ordeal. Bob Marley and David Bowie played in the background. The videotape was deemed too graphic and disturbing to show at the eventual trial, but the audio was allowed. On it, Bernardo can be heard instructing Mahaffey to submit to him while she cried out in pain. At one point, Mahaffey can be heard commenting that the blindfold Homolka had placed over her eyes was slipping and that she might be able to see them and later identify them. Unwilling to let that happen, Bernardo and Homolka committed their first intentional murder. Homolka drugged the girl as she had done in the past, but this time administered a lethal dose. Bernardo went to the local hardware store and purchased several bags of cement which the couple used to encase the dismembered parts of Leslie Mahaffey's body. Then, they dumped the body-filled blocks into a local lake. 
Later, one of these blocks would wash up on the lakeshore and reveal an orthodontic implant, which would identify Mahaffey as the couple's third murder victim. However, before that could happen, one more teenaged girl would fall victim to the murderous duo in 1992, a 15-year-old named Kristen French. As they had done with Leslie Mahaffey, the couple filmed themselves raping and torturing her and forced her to consume alcohol and submit not only to Bernardo's sexual deviances, but to Homolka's as well. This time, however, it appeared that the couple intended to murder their victim from the get-go as French was never blindfolded. Kristen French's body was found in April of 1992. She was naked with her hair cut in a roadside ditch. Homolka later admitted that the hair had not been cut as a trophy but in the hopes that it would make it harder for the police to identify her. Despite her hand in the rape and torture of four young girls and the murder of three, Carla Homolka was never actually arrested for her crimes. Instead, she turned herself in. In December of 1992, Paul Bernardo beat Homolka with a metal flashlight, severely bruising and landing her in the hospital. She was released after insisting that she had been in an automobile accident, but suspicious friends of hers alerted her aunt and uncle that foul play may have been involved. Meanwhile, Canadian authorities were in search of the so-called Scarborough Rapist and felt confident they had found their criminal in Paul Bernardo. He was subsequently swabbed for DNA and fingerprinted, as was Homolka. During that period of questioning, Homolka learned the Bernardo had been identified as the rapist. And to protect herself, Homolka admitted to her uncle that Bernardo had abused her, that he was the Scarborough rapist, and that she had been involved in several of his crimes. Horrified, Homolka's family insisted she go to the police, which she ultimately did. Immediately, Homolka began filling the police in on Bernardo's crimes including ones he had committed before they met that he had boasted about to her. While their house was being searched, Bernardo's lawyer wandered in and retrieved some 100 audio tapes from behind a light fixture on which the couple had recorded their heinous crimes. The lawyer kept those tapes hidden. In court, Homolka painted herself as an unwilling and abused pawn in Bernardo's horrific schemes. Homolka divorced Bernardo during this time, and many jurors were inclined to believe that Homolka was indeed nothing more than a victim. She reached a plea bargain in 1993 and was sentenced to 12 years in prison with eligibility for parole after three years of good behavior. Canadian press deemed this choice on behalf of the court a deal with the devil. Carla Homolka now continues to receive backlash for what many have dubbed the worst plea deal in Canadian history. Paul Bernardo was convicted on almost 30 counts of rape and murder and received a life sentence on September 1, 1995. In February 2018, he was denied parole. Homolka was released in 2005 to outrage from the public, much of which had been ongoing since her short sentence was announced. After her release, she remarried and settled into a small community in Quebec. Carla Homolka now has come under the scrutiny of this community. Neighbors began a Facebook page titled Watching Carla Homolka in an effort to track her whereabouts out of fear and anger about her freedom. She has since changed her name to Leanne Thiel. She spent some time in Antilles and Guadalupe under the name Leanne Bordelais with her new husband but as of 2014, had returned to the Canadian province where she spends time evading the press, spending time with her family of three children, and volunteering on her children's field trips. Carla Homolka now seems far removed from those disturbing days of the Ken and Barbie killers. What started out as a college romance ended in murder and mystery. Scott Peterson and Lassie Rocha met in 1994 while both were attending college at California Polytechnic State University. They married two years later. In 2002, Lacey became pregnant. The two lived in Modesto, California, and planned to raise their unborn son Connor there. 
Scott Peterson says that on Christmas Eve morning, he left his pregnant wife alone to go fishing about 90 miles away at the Berkeley Marina. He says that Lacey planned to walk the couple's dog, Mackenzie, and mop the kitchen floor. When Scott returned home hours later, he says he found Mackenzie there alone, still wearing a leash, but no sign of Lassie. That evening, Lacey's stepfather called the police to report her missing. Family, friends, and volunteers launched a huge search for Lassie Peterson. Scott Peterson was interviewed by police in the early hours of Christmas Day. Now retired Modesto police detective John Bueller says, Scott didn't seem as interested as one would expect. Oftentimes, a victim who's left behind is firing tons of questions at us, and we didn't get any of that from him. Less than a week after Lacey Peterson went missing, Modesto detectives raced over to investigate an intriguing lead. A Fresno massage therapist named Amber Frey revealed that she had been dating Scott Peterson for over a month. She told police that Peterson had lied to her and said he was single. Former Detective Boiler notes, her recall was fantastic. It was almost like it was a script from a Hallmark TV show or something. Amber Frey recalled every detail of their romantic dates down to what they were wearing, hoping for clues that might lead them to the missing woman. Detectives ask Frey to record phone calls between her and Scott Peterson, and she agrees. In an explosive press conference one month after Lacey Peterson goes missing, Amber Frey publicly reveals her affair with Scott Peterson. I am very sorry for Lacey's family and the pain that this has caused them, she said. And I pray for her safe return as well. Prior to Frey going public, Peterson had told her in a recorded call that he was in Paris when he was really in Modesto, while the search for Lassie was still on. Eventually, Scott admitted to her, I've lied to you that I've been traveling. Those recorded calls would later become part of a damning case against Peterson. On April 13th and 14th, 2003, two bodies are found on the shores of the San Francisco Bay. They are later identified as Lacey Peterson and her unborn child. The two bodies were found about a mile apart. Authorities caught up with Scott Peterson on April 18th at a golf course in San Diego and arrested him. Authorities found a wad of cash, his brother's ID card, and multiple cell phones inside the vehicle. Days later, Peterson pleaded not guilty to two counts of capital murder. Scott Peterson's trial begins in San Mateo County, California, in June 2004. Because of massive publicity, the trial was moved from Modesto to Redwood City in San Mateo County. The decision was made because the judge decided it would be difficult for Peterson to get a fair trial too close to home, where emotions were running high. In what many consider a major turning point of the trial, Amber Frey took the stand for the first time to tell the jury about her relationship with Scott Peterson, a secretly married man, and about all the lies he told her. Frey painted a picture of a dishonest man who could tell falsehoods with ease, hurting his credibility. Jurors heard the lies for themselves in those recorded phone calls Frey made. Scott Peterson was found guilty of first-degree murder for the death of his wife, Lassie, and second-degree murder for the death of his unborn son, Connor. Crowds outside cheer. In March 2005, four months after his conviction, Scott Peterson is sentenced to death. At a press conference, juror number seven, Rochelle Nice, called Peterson a jerk and commented San Quentin is your new home, referring to the prison where he would serve his sentence. Nice was nicknamed Strawberry Shortcake during the trial because of her hair color. In August 2020, after two appeals, Scott Peterson's death sentence was overturned by the California Supreme Court after deciding that the original trial judge made a mistake when jurors were being picked for trial. The result of that mistake, Peterson's supporters say, was that the jury was stacked with pro-death penalty jurors. Peterson shown here in 2018, will now receive a new trial for only the sentence phase. The court upheld his murder convictions. 
The California Supreme Court orders a lower court to re-examine Peterson's murder convictions and decide if he should get an entire new trial. Scott Peterson's supporters say it all comes down to the actions of that juror once nicknamed Strawberry Shortcake, Rachel Nice, pictured here in 2005 during jury selection. Prospective jurors filled out a questionnaire asking if they had in the past been in a lawsuit and if they had been crime victims. Nice checked no. It's pretty clear that she lied to us straight to our face about her own situation. Peterson's current attorney, Pat Harris, stated, In fact, Nice was involved in two domestic disputes in the past. But prosecutors say when Nice filled out that questionnaire, she didn't lie. She just didn't think her past experiences were relevant to the questions and didn't see herself as a victim. Now a lower court will consider if Peterson will get a complete retrial. In March 2021, CBS News Jonathan Vigliotti interviewed Scott Peterson's sister-in-law, Janie Peterson, in her war room of evidence. She claims proves his innocence. She claims witnesses saw Lassie walking in the neighborhood near the Peterson home after the time Scott said he left for the fishing trip. If that's true, Scott couldn't have killed Lacey. Scott Peterson's attorney explains, there's been a lot of criticism because we didn't call some witnesses who saw Lassie that day, and that the thought process at the time was that a number of the witnesses who saw her didn't have great memories or were contradicting each other. Retired detective John Boiler says, there are no witnesses who saw Lacey alive that morning. He says there were other young women in the neighborhood who were pregnant and looked similar to Lassie and that it would be real easy for somebody to mistakenly see one of those three girls as being Lacey. Still, Janie Peterson insists that Scott is innocent. Perhaps more important to a new defense case is what Janie Peterson believes actually happened to Lassie. She points to a burglary she believes happened on the same day Lacey disappeared, right across the street from the Peterson home. Scott Peterson's supporters theorize that Lassie confronted the burglars, and that ended badly. But police quickly arrested the burglars, Stephen Todd and Donald Pierce, pictured here in a 2003 Modesto Police Department press release. Scott Peterson appeared in court remotely for a status hearing on a new death penalty trial. In December 2021, Scott Peterson is resentenced to life in prison without parole. Peterson and his supporters maintain the wrong man is in prison for Lacey and Connor's deaths. According to Detective Weller, well, I guess it's possible, but you know, there's still people that believe the earth is flat too. Shanann Watts was facing health problems in 2010 when she met Chris. I was in a really, really, really bad place. And I got a friend request from Chris on Facebook. She said in an online video about four months before her death. I was like, oh, what the heck? I'm never going to meet him. Well, one thing led to another. And eight years later, we have two kids. We live in Colorado, and he's the best thing that has ever happened to me. After the couple moved to Colorado, they started a family. Bella was born in December 2013. Shannon was so excited to have her first baby girl, her family wrote in her obituary, how she loved and cherished her. Less than two years later, in July 2015, Celeste was born. Oh, how Shannon was so excited to be able to have another child because of her battle with lupus, her family wrote. Every moment with her was a blessing. In 2018, Shanann became pregnant again with a baby boy she planned to name Nico. By all outward appearances, the couple's marriage was strong. However, in the summer of 2018, Shannon noticed that things had changed. He has changed. I don't know who he is. She texted a friend on August 7th. He hasn't touched me all week. Kissed me. Talked to me except for when I'm trying to figure out what is wrong. We've never had a problem in our relationship like this. I just want to cry. Shanann and the girls were last seen on Monday, August 13th, 2018.
Chris Watts gave a series of stilted television interviews after their disappearance, pleading for their safe return. We had an emotional conversation, he told Denver 7, a day after his family was reported missing. She wasn't here. The kids weren't here. Nobody was here. On August 16th, Shanann's body was found on the property of Anadarko Petroleum Corporation, an oil and gas company where Chris had worked. Daughters Bella and Celeste were located later that day in oil tanks near Shanann's body. Shannon had been strangled while the girls had been smothered, all with Chris' bare hands. Chris was arrested on three counts of first-degree murder and three counts of tampering with a body. While in police custody, Chris claimed that he told Shannon that he wanted to separate. He alleged that he went downstairs and noticed Shannon strangling Celeste, and that Bella's lifeless body was nearby. He ran upstairs in a rage, he claimed, and strangled Shannon. Cops didn't believe his story. His story didn't match the evidence that we had, police stated at the time. We believe that Chris killed them all. Authorities soon learned that Chris was having an affair with Nicol Kessinger, who worked at his company. After she learned about the murders, Kessinger cooperated with the police. Before coming forward, Kessinger appeared to worry about the public shaming that she might face. Did people hate Amber Frey? She typed into an internet search, invoking the name of the woman who was having an affair with infamous killer Scott Peterson, who murdered his wife, Lassie, and their unborn child in 2002. Kessinger told authorities that she believed that Watts was going through an amicable divorce. Hundreds of mourners assembled at Sacred Heart Catholic Church in Pinehurst, North Carolina, to pay their final respects to Shanann, her daughters, and her unborn son, Nico. I always worried about her and the girls being so far because I couldn't protect them. Shannon's brother, Frankie R. Zuzek, wrote in her eulogy. Zuzek didn't mention Chris Watts in his eulogy, but had previously lashed out at him, calling him a heartless psychopath and saying he stole my whole world. In a bombshell turn of events, on November 6, 2018, Watts pleaded guilty to the slayings of his pregnant wife and their young children in exchange for being spared a possible death sentence. The evidence against him was overwhelming. He had no choice, considering the evidence. It took time for him to come around, but he did. But not everyone was happy with the plea agreement. Watts' mother, Cindy, said in several interviews that she thought the confession and the plea were coerced. On November 19, 2018, Watts was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The defendant coldly and deliberately ended four lives, prosecutors said of Shanann, her girls, and her unborn child. During the victim impact statements, Shannon's father, Frank Erzukek, repeatedly referred to Watts as a monster and an evil person. I have no idea who gave you the right to take their lives. Shannon's mother, Sandra Urzusek, said. But I know God and his mighty angels were there in that moment to bring them home to paradise. On March 7, 2019, a video of Chris Watts' full confession, which he'd provided to investigators in February, was made public. In the video, he told investigators from the Colorado Bureau of Investigation that on the night of the murders, he'd jumped on Shannon in bed after he'd told her he didn't love her anymore, he claims she threatened to leave him and take the children. Then Watts drove 45 minutes to a remote oil field with Shanann's corpse in the bed of the truck and his still living girls in the back seat. Before burying Shanann in a shallow grave, Watts said he smothered Celeste in the back seat. After dumping Celeste's body in an old field, he returned to smother Bella, who begged for her life. As he went to kill her, Bella screamed, Daddy, no! And it was the last words she spoke. According to sources, Watt's life in jail is anything but stimulating. For an hour a day, he gets out of his cell for showers and exercise. He remains in the evaluation unit of the prison. In his cell, he's allowed to have a Bible, but not much more. With so much free time, 
Watts has spent a lot of time thinking about his past, says a friend of Watts. He's sad that everyone is hurting. He wishes he could go back in time. He wishes he had handled things differently. In July 2019, Chris Watts claimed in a chilling jailhouse letter to his mother that he was a changed man with a newfound relationship with God. His mother, Cindy Watts, was interviewed in the HLN special, Killer Dad, Chris Watts Speaks. During the show, she read the letter she received from her son. I'm still a dad. I'm still a son. No matter what, Watts wrote. Now, I can add servant of God to that mix. He has shown me peace, peace, love, and forgiveness. And that's how I live every day. A 2020 Netflix documentary titled American Murder, The Family Next Door revealed the final text messages Shanann sent her husband. Finally on plane and about to take off, she wrote in her last text to Chris, Thank God. Prayers for a safe flight. Love you. Chris did not respond. Watts had no criminal record or history of domestic violence before the murders, according to FBI agents, who also explained general warning signs to identify domestic violence. This case shows that domestic violence can happen anywhere, Lee said. It affects so many families, and sometimes the results can be deadly. Graham Young could have just been a kid who loved science, but his chemistry set would actually prove to be a lethal tool in the arsenal of a depraved serial killer, earning him the nickname Teacup Poisoner, and eventually life in prison. Graham Young was born in North London, England, on September 7, 1947, and didn't have the easiest start in childhood. When he was a baby, Young's mother Bessie died of tuberculosis. Too distraught to care for his son, Young's father, Fred, sent the child to live with his aunt, Winnie. Young grew attached to his aunt over the next two years, and when he went to live with his father after he remarried in 1950, Graham suffered severe separation anxiety. He neglected his peers and took up solitary hobbies. These included a particular fascination with chemistry and toxicology. They also included reading about notorious murderers. Not seeing any warning signs, Frank encouraged Graham Young's penchant for science by buying him a chemistry set. He would spend hours with it, and pupils at his school even took to calling him the mad professor. Young became so well-versed in the ins and outs of toxicology that he was able to acquire large quantities of poisonous chemicals at the age of 13 by convincing professional chemists he was older, and that the use was for study purposes. That's when Graham Young began testing his knowledge of poisons, using real people as his subjects. He would serve tea laced with poisonous concoctions to his family and schoolmates. In 1961, his stepmother Molly started developing bad stomach cramps. Young's father and older sister began to suffer similar pains soon after. Then, a classmate named Christopher Williams developed similar symptoms. But nobody suspected that Graham Young had anything to do with the mysterious illnesses. They assumed it was some kind of contagious stomach bug. Matters took a turn when Graham Young's sister, Winifred, once again became extremely ill while on her way to work. She was taken to the hospital where doctors discovered belladonna, the ancient extract of deadly nightshade in her system. Meanwhile, Young's behavior had gotten progressively more bizarre. He idolized Adolf Hitler and started wearing a swastika. One of his science experiments also blew up in the kitchen of the family home. On April 21, 1962, Molly Young was rushed to the hospital in excruciating pain. She died later that night. It was found out later on that Young had slowly been poisoning his stepmother's tea with antimony, to which she developed a tolerance. The night before her death, he switched to thallium in order to quicken the process. However, Molly was cremated. Thus, her remains couldn't be analyzed, and Young remained on his dark path. But Young's aunt, the one he had lived with as a young child, 
knew about his fascination, was poison and became suspicious. She had him sent to a psychiatrist who recommended calling the police. On May 23, 1962, Graham Young was arrested. He confessed to the murder of his stepmom as well as the poisoning of his other family members. But due to the stepmother's cremation, there was no evidence to substantiate Young's confession and he wasn't charged with the murder. Instead, he was placed in the Broadmoor Maximum Security Hospital. At age 14, Young was Broadmoor's youngest inmate. By June 1970, his doctors at the hospital deemed him cured. Shockingly, Young informed a psychiatric nurse upon his release that he was planning on killing one person for each year he had been in Broadmoor. According to an article in Criminal Behavior and Mental Health, the comment was recorded in his file, but, stunningly, didn't affect the decision to let him free. Once released, what else would Young do but work at a laboratory that manufactured infrared lenses for military equipment made from thallium? He went to work at John Hadlin Laboratories, where his employers were aware of his psychiatric stay, but didn't know the reason behind it or his criminal history, for that matter. As such, when Young offered to make coffee and tea for his co-workers, they merely viewed it as a kind gesture. Soon, sickness swept through the lab. Young's colleagues chalked it up to a bug going around. As without the knowledge of his disturbing history, they had no reason to suspect that their kind co-worker, who always offered them beverages, was actually poisoning them. It was only when an employee named Bob Eagle died that suspicion began to arise yet again. Eagle had gotten better when he was home, only to get sick again when he returned to work. He then became completely debilitated before dying on July 7, 1971. A second death, that of 60-year-old Fred Biggs, occurred soon after. By this point, nearly 70 employees had experienced similar symptoms of the two men who died. Suspicions began to arise yet again. Ultimately, it was Graham Young's own zealousness that did him in. Young asked the staff doctor why thallium poisoning wasn't being considered a cause since it was used on site. Surprised and concerned by Young's in-depth knowledge of toxicology, the doctor reported the exchange to the management who then alerted the police. An investigative team found Young's diary in which he described with scientific detachment the experiments of how he poisoned his co-workers. They also found thallium in his pockets. Young was sentenced to life in prison in June 1972. In 1990, he was found dead in his cell, with the official cause of death recorded as a heart attack. But speculation remains that, tired of life in prison, he conducted one final scientific experiment on himself. But Young's story didn't die with him. Instead, his life and deadly work inspired the Blackley comic 1995 film, The Young Poisoner's Handbook, and he even got his own waxwork for a time at Madame Tussaud's Chamber of Horrors in London. If you enjoyed the video, please show your support by subscribing and liking the video, and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any future uploads.